I would like now to talk a little bit about what happens with our manuscripts once they are digitized. As I said, um, when we started off, uh, we had our own little server and we hosted the manuscripts um, um, on a web page, HTML web page, so to say, um, and that's it. But now, of course, um, a lot of development has been going on and repositories are now uh, the standard. You need to think a lot about long-term archiving, which is a big issue. I'll come back to it, as I said. Um, but first of all, what do we do with our manuscripts once they're digitized? We have got our own repository, our own platform to host it now. Um, you can um, access it via the University Library uh, webpage. If you scroll down, um, it's called, there's Unicup, that's the library catalog, and there's Unipub. And there, are, on the one side, you, we publish modern, modern books here. Um, university publications like master, th master thesis and um, also journals um, edited by, by the university. But we have got our own setup here for the manuscript department. Um, let's see. And what we tried here is um, I've been talking about digitizing manuscripts a lot, but um, we are called special collections because we have lots of different things. So manuscripts are a big part of the department and a big research field, of course, but we've got um, a lot of other collections as well collected over the years, as most um, libraries um, have. There's always stuff coming in, as Eri, for example, yesterday told you about the papyrus. It's like, why do we have it? What do we do with it? So we've got so many s different things going on that we also wanted to have them represented in our repository and work on various uh, subjects. That's another thing. There's also, also always um, work going on in different fields, yeah, depending on the person. So we've got different projects going on all the time. And that's what's represented in, uh, represented in our digital archive as well, in our repository. You can see, for example, we have here, um, this is an ongoing project about digitizing books from the 16th century and connecting them to the German catalog of printed books from the 16th century, the VD16. It's hosted by the um, um, library in, in, in Munich, by the Staatsbibliothek. Bayerische Staatsbibliothek. Um, and um, then we've got other, other projects going on also with other institutions within the university. For example, we digitized our um, dissertation, um, dissertations, our handwritten dissertations, and connected them to the um, archival material in the university archive. That was a project. Then this Digidomus is a platform for cookbooks, medieval cookbooks and early modern cookbooks, always very popular, also with the general public cookbooks cookeries, an issue lots of people are interested in, you can sell them, sell it well, so to say, to the public. Um, but it's also, this is also our archive for, as we see it as, on the one hand, we want to represent what's going on in the, in the um, collection, but it's an archive for us as well, for work that has been done, and we want to keep it accessible for us also, and not only within the institution as it used to be but to the public. For example, here, Digi Expo. Um, there used to be um, exhibitions at the university library. In the, I think they started off in the 80s and they did little exhibitions on various topics. And there have been catalogs game, given out um, about this exhibition. And we've been digitizing the catalogs and archiving them online because as you've probably heard, this building is pretty new and the old building was abolished and we had to get rid of stuff, so to say. And these catalogs, um, there have been a, lo um, a lot of stock there. So we just kept one, uh, one piece back catalog and digitized them in order to have a digital copy as well. So this is just a pragmatic solution, so to say, um, to make room for other things. Um, then we have um, our fragments, fragment, um, fragmentology, and I think you were talking about fragments in the class, in the course as well. Yes, um, fragment uh, research is um, a pretty current and pretty um, 
popular topic now because of the internet it's possible so to say before back before them it was very difficult people only could could do research on their own fragments within their collection which is very limited when it comes to fragment research but you will hear more about this later on in your class but our fragments are accessible here now and then we have um, travel reports also a very popular issue with the general public so we also try to have um, access to, to a more general um, public and not only researchers. Then we have, um, this is um, a, a project going on with the library, library for um, law, library of law. They have uh, old books as well in their collection and they are digitizing them and making them accessible via, via our platform. So we are sort of a general platform for the university when it comes to old and rare books. Um, then we have here um, historical catalogs, library catalogs. This is a project that has popped up because of my PhD, I have to say, uh, because we have um, collections of books within our collection from monasteries, from former monasteries, which have been abolished. But the book catalogues are held in the archive, in the local archive here. So we have the books and they have the catalog, which doesn't really make sense, so to say. But um, they won't give us the catalog. <laughs> so uh, we at least made the deal, so to say, to have a digital copy and to have uh, one version of us within our institution. This is, kind of, is a problem of a historical problem because um, books often ha travel far and wide and you don't always can retrace the steps. And for administrative purposes, as I said, the catalogs are here, the books are there. Yeah, and with digital, um, with the help of uh, digital humanities and, and the digital world, you can connect these things again which is good. Um, yeah, I don't want to go to anything. You can see there are a lot of different, different things going on um, within the collection. So it's just a representation of the various materials we have and host within the collection. But the manuscripts, as I said, are a big part and they are hosted within our digi script, we called it. <clears throat> And it's a digital platform, as I said. Here, all the manuscripts are listed. Um, all the manuscripts are listed by uh, their number because uh, for manuscripts, a title is not very representative. As I said, I have an annotated version of the Epistles of St. Paul. Yeah, so has every other institution having medieval manuscripts doesn't say anything at all. Um, the number of the manuscript and the holding institution is the significant um, factor because each book is individual and has its individual things. So even though the library in Vienna also have, has an annotated version, maybe from the same annotator even, of the Epistles of St. Paul, still the book would look completely different and will be a completely different book. So that's why the manuscript number is so important. It is the main, main um, Cat category when it comes to cataloging manuscripts as well. Um, our online catalog is still very much work in progress, I have to say. Um, the thing is, there is a big project going on of, um, in Germany about a general uh, manuscript catalog. They remodel it now. There used to be an old one, um, but it's outdated already, so they're working on a new one. It's been going on for four years now, but it's still not done. And everywhere around the world, people are at the moment very much working on their catalogs and um, trying to um, get um, adapt to the new te technology and make new use of the new technology, just like IIIF. Are, is an issue, for example, and um, so many things going on with the semantic web, the connection and everything. And that's something um, that people now need, to, or collections now need to adapt in their catalogs. As I said, it's since the early 2000s, and a lot of people have been digitizing, but the technology had, has changed immensely. And right now, everybody's adapting 
their catalog, so to say, to take in the new technology. And so we are trying, we, we are trying the same here. So that's why it's very much work in progress. Um, what we did now, for example, is that we integrated the manuscripts within the uh, general library catalog, which is not self-evident because um, in former days it used to be that um, manuscript catalogs are special catalogs, they still are, and um, are completely separate from general library catalogs because uh, people interested in manuscripts and manuscript researchers, they wouldn't browse in a, in a library catalog to find a manuscript. But this has somehow changed because of Google and the access to it. So there's a more this tendency to have a general access to everything and then go on and specialize. Um, plus um, the way the library catalogs work now um, is different. I don't want to go into details here, but just the way the infrastructure works in the library makes sense to have a general cataloging of manuscripts within the library catalog as well and have an access here and then filter it, so to say, rather than having just special databases which you need to know. So back in the days you always needed to know where to look. You needed already to be a bit proficient in the manuscript research in order to find your images. Now people try to be more open, which is to some extent problematic because you now uh, if you look for Bible in a library catalog, you also find manuscripts and I don't know if uh, student of theology would be happy with um, a manuscript from the 16th century or something like that when he wants to have a modern Bible, so to say. Yeah, but um, yeah, technology is changing and so need the catalogs. But I don't know, maybe you will be talking more about library catalogs, for example, like Ecoditas or something? We're going to talk more about the ways that we digitize the encoding of cataloging but not necessarily the technology of how people implement their catalogs because that feels a little individual to institutions. Yeah, it's true. It's true. But it's just general trends and stuff. Equitas in, in Switzerland, they always like um, the model a bit because they've got a pretty good catalog. They've lots of money, one has to say, and uh, they are always um, doing uh, good and interesting things. So that's where we look for inspiration, so to say, and see how things are going. We try to keep up <laughs> because our funds are not limitless, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but um, here you have some, just some basic information about the manuscripts. As I said, um, there's going to be a detailed uh, catalogue of the manuscri manuscripts, um, which we are still working on. So uh, right now you only have basic metadata going on, I have to say. Um, but then you also have the structure of the manus manuscript. Yeah. Slow. Come on. Yeah, I give it some more time. Maybe it works. <clears throat> um, and that's why I talked about the file naming um, early on. For example, here we then represent the structure of the monastery. So you have the title page. I mean, you don't really have that with the monastery, but the main page. And you have the bindings and you have the spine. And everything of a manuscript carries information, so you need all the parts. Whereas with a modern book, it's, it's, it's plenty to have the title page and that's good. With a, manus a manuscript, it's different. You need all the parts because every part has information on it. And every part t tells you something about the being of uh, the, how the book came into being, so to say. Because back then the books were written on separate sheets from different people, um, annotated from different persons, then the, the mar margins and the illuminations are sometimes from different periods even. And then you have the binding which came, which has been changed over time. So everything carries information and tells you something about how this book came into being. Um, I wondered on that, um, if you have a damaged book where mm -hmm. binder's waste is mm -hmm. visible through the spine, does it go to conservation first or would you want to digitize the binder's waste before the spine is repaired? Um, both, so to say. So we always talk to our conservator, of course, before digitizing and if it's okay to digitize. But um, we want the for, one thing is modern conservation is about conserving the state, not repairing. So repairing is is very is done very scarcely. It used to be back then they they changed 
the cover because, oh, this is broken. We get rid of the old cover, put on a new one. Now there is a big awareness of that everything carries information, everything is important. So you wouldn't repair it. You would make it um, just usable. So a conservative would, would um, make reparations in a sense that she would add little things in order to make the book openable and, and usable for researchers, but that's it. She wouldn't repair the spine, she wouldn't do anything. But um, if there is anything like this going on, like major, major, um, major um, changes are necessary, also because maybe of insects or something, we don't have that here luckily, but other libraries, um, for example, the monastery libraries, modern monastery libraries often have the problem because they don't have ideal conditions for the books. So um, you would also document the state, pre-state, so what it looked before later, so we try to document every step if possible. But as I said, modern conservation is very much about just keeping it the way it is and having it in some way prepared in a way to use it. That's it. No, rep no changes. Okay, um, as I said, here you can see the, um, just the general um, build up of the, of the um, manuscript. So, um, the different parts of it are represented and you can access them separately and then you have just the files. And the, it's not an ideal view on the phone as you can see, but yeah, just to get an idea. Yeah. Are the images that you're serving here preservation quality or are they um, smaller files? They're smaller files, yeah. So we, that's, some, that's actually a good input because I wanted to talk about long-term archiving and that kind of plays into here. Uh, what we do is um, we upload our files on a server infrastructure provided by, um, it's like the Austrian body of libraries. So we have a common body in Austria, which is dealing with all the libraries and it's like um, funded uh, from the different institutions, so to say, and they have a server infrastructure, so they host the files. Um, and then um, the provider of the repository um, just um, reduces the file size in order to make it um, accessible, easier accessible on the web. So you get a reduced version on the web to make it more, because otherwise it would way, be way too slow. Our uh, a, a, a typical manuscript has like 12 gigabytes or something. So mm, would take you ages, I think, to to open it. Um, but we, uh, so we have these two versions also, so a working version and uh, an uh, archival version. But long-term archiving is a big issue, an unsolved problem very much, I have to say. Um, back when we started off, we uh, saved our files, our images on CDs. That was like the best technology there was back then. And people were saying, yeah, yeah, no, it's gonna last, it's gonna last. Yeah, 20 years later, you can chuck most of the CD, uh, CDs because they don't work properly or some of the files got lost. And yeah, it's not, not an archival, not for archiving. And um, now uh, we use um, hard drives. If you've seen, I've got a lot of hard drives going on, but these are mainly for working purposes. So that's where we store our files in order to deal with it in everyday, on an everyday basis. And we have got a small servers for ourselves. Um, and then we have the big server infrastructure built up um, in Vienna. But the problem is, as I said, long-term archiving is, is an unsolved issue. They are working on it everywhere, but um, yeah, it's, it's um, still data migration. There come a lot of things into it which make long-term archiving a big issue. When we started off in the 90s, um, the um, technology was completely different. The software was completely different. Now you have trouble accessing these files. And now we are at the time now with digital, in the digital world, that, that this is a big problem all, everywhere, data migration. How, what do you do with old data? We also see it with a lot with platforms, um, digital and humanities platforms also from the early days, which are not accessible anymore. Three years projects going on and then no server to host it anymore and it's shut down. It's a big, big issue and a big concern. So I don't know, it's not, not solved yet, as I said, but that's also what, 
one thing that comes into play when I talk about talked about camera uh, camera technology, for example, if you use a Hasselblad and you have massive images with massive file sizes, where do you store them? On a long-term basis, I mean, we have got trouble. It's very expensive to to have this server infrastructure. The bigger the files, the less space you have, the more expensive it gets. So it's really tricky, a tricky issue which we are working on. And that's why we now have so many uh, um, saving devices, so many backups. So as I said, we have our hard drives, we have our little server, we have the server infrastructure in Vienna, because one version is not enough in order to guarantee a sort of long-term archiving. And how um, things turn out in the future, we will see. I mean, these manuscripts, they have lasted for centuries. Our digital versions, we will see how long they're going to last. And as I said, we now redoing the things that we've done in the 90s because technology has changed so much. So it's a bit of an, of an issue. Um, out of curiosity, can I ask what's the size of your repository? Um, how many terabytes, I presume, do you have of digitized manuscripts? Oh, I, I have no idea, to be honest. I, I can't really say. We, we, I, I ha would have asked the, com the company how much space we've used up yet. But as I said, like a manuscript like this has like 12 gigabytes, something like this, even more. So we have bigger ones with like 20, 30. So and we have 2,200 manuscripts and lots of other things up there. <laughs> That's why I said it's it's not often people say, hey, yeah, but you don't use um, like high rate, rate equipment or the best camera. Yeah, but how do you store it? How do you store it? What do you do with it then? So the 2,000 manuscripts are digital? Not all of them. We're still working on them because you would think 2,200 is a lot, but not that much. But as I said, we were funded pretty much, we funded ourselves pretty much. So that's why we rely, relied on contracts with other universities. That's why our own stuff didn't get digitized so quickly. We are at, I think, 1,000 now, something like that, yeah. So half of them are done. Uh, I also have a practical question because you you presented um, many projects to us, and I have this really um, practical question. For example, if you have a funded project for three years and they aim at doing, let's say, a, crit a digital critical edition or um, a project that involves uh, digitization of manuscripts, what what happens after that with this project that is really for a very limited period? let's say that the, the project is based at the University of Graz, do you, do you store the data that's, that's an issue. As I said, um, people are now working very much on the digital infrastructure because it's clear now that these, this is problematic. In the early days, people just did their project and then, okay, now a lot of things don't work anymore because the service drink infrastructure isn't there anymore. Nobody's there to host it and finance it. But that's what we are trying, for example, here at the university library. We try to build, be the center where people from the university can come to and we provide this storage and we provide this infrastructure. For example, with the repository, with the repository, as I said, we're working a lot with other institutions, for example, the museum, the archive, they don't have their own infrastructure. So we say, okay, we host the files for you and we try to guarantee a long-term preservation of these things because we have the infrastructure and we also have the, the metadata, metadata work, um, works and everything that, they often rely on one person in a project and then when the person is gone, nothing is going on anymore. And we try to be this, this sort of common ground within the university. There's also at the moment um, a new department built for um, research data management in the university library where all the research projects um, with going on within the university can store their data because it's now obligatory for a project within the Austrian research fund to, if you do a project, you have to guarantee that your data is, has some sort of long-term archiving. It's standard now, but there's no infrastructure yet. So it's a bit <laughs> nice to have a standard. That's the thing about standard. Nice to have a standard, but if there's no proper infrastructure, how do you do it? And uh, it's also worth 
uh, mentioned, there are actually different repositories at the university for different things. There's the open access repository that she was just talking about. There's the university library manuscripts. Something like an online critical edition would probably actually be handled by our department, the Zentrum für Informationsmoldierung, and we run our own bespoke uh, humanities asset management system called the GAMS. Um, and that is a long-term repository which also has a web interface for the actual presentational elements. And okay. so there are these specialized projects which have somewhat overlapping but different focuses. Yeah, and these have been sort of developing within the university and I think now we very much try to work together and see how things go together because we, ha we need to have this infrastructure uh, but um, it's, it's um, a grown system, so to say. For example, um, the GAMS is also it's for completely different purposes, so you could use it for different, different projects. As you said, like digital criti critical edition is not something we could host. We just host the files and the data um, and provide help with the metadata. But um, you need to know where to, to go to. But I think the cooperation with the team is something that um, we also want to be the partner where people can come to and ask, okay, what can I do now? And then we try to refer to the respective uh, department which would be um, responsible for hosting and archiving projects. Yeah. Okay, any more questions about the digital asset management repository? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, of course. Yeah. So, um, okay, we've been talking about uh, medieval manuscripts, early modern books uh, a lot. And as you've seen, you've seen now how we in Graz digitize them. I mean, there are different approaches, of course. But as I said, the Graz table has its advantages and that's why we stick to it. Um, yeah, but um, the digitization in lab, lab in Graz is very much a grown system, as I said, over the years, um, different issues have popped up. And we've started up, off with digitizing manuscripts, but now modern digitization, of course, digitization of modern books has become more and more and more an issue. And now, especially with uh, COVID, I mean, it has like exploded. I have the feeling before that already, but now even more so. Uh, and the university has no digitization center other than us. So we have just by chance somehow also taken on um, digitizing modern books. And now it has become equally important um, as the pre-modern books. Um, that's just, yeah, the way it, it is and historically grown, so to say. So we've got different devices for, modern, uh, for digitizing modern books. I have to say, I'm not an expert here. Um, that's not my, my field. I just work with the old books usually, but I can show you some things at least. Um, with, as we have said already about the pre-modern books, you need special devices for special needs. And it's also true for modern books. Even the old modern books are not, you don't need to be that careful, let's say. Still, I wouldn't keep cutting books up for digitizing, but the, it's, it's a different approach, so to say. But there are different, uh, machines nowadays for different needs and different books. So in digitization technology, a lot has, has, has been developed, a lot has come up, and we have all sorts of different machinery for different needs. For example, you can see here an A0 scanner. Um, it's, um, suck, uh, I don't know the English term, but it just sucks in the pages. Um, and that's something, for example, we'd use for maps and, and architectural plans and something like that. So that's um, one thing. We have projects, the, the one or other project where this comes in handy and is needful because otherwise you don't have, um, we don't have devices for this big sizes, so to say. So that's, that's something we can have here. Then we have, for example, for DIA. That has also been funded by a project. It's a scanner for DS, specially made. We had this project going on about DS from the archive, and that's where we have this scanner now. Yeah, so different um, for different material. Um, now, hang on. This is the this is the DS scanner. This is the no. These are both. 
sorry. Um, this is a, just a plain scanner. We use an everyday scanner. Nothing special here, but different equipment. And um, over there we come to the more specialized things. Um, this one is a Zeutschel scanner. Zeutschel is a big company in the German-speaking European area, so to say, selling scanners. Um, you also see them standing around now in um, the libraries, um, in the student areas of the libraries. They're just plain book scanners, so to say, but they are good to handle and, and, and also um, very uh, conservationally, conservationally now um, highly developed so that they are also used in, in um, normal settings, so to say, instead of um, copy machines. People like to use them. You can store your files on a USB stick and it's easy to handle, easier than a copy machine, for example. This is a more advanced version, but you can see a smaller version uh, downstairs, for example, in the students' area. We have them standing around the campus all over the place. Um, yeah, so that's a big company now um, settled on developing uh, digitization machinery and devices. So it's chill. Um, then over here we have a Treven uh, um, Quitenus. Um, that's also a German product, so to say. It's a little team of three people developing it. Um, the key thing here is again you have this book cradle, and you put the book. You can come over and have a look. And then I will maybe just check it out. It's the thing is you have this book cradle again and um, the key here is we have two cameras on either side and a hand device. So it's a bit different system. You, um, you use it for modern book. My colleague, uh, it was my colleagues in the modern digitization, his favorite, mach favorite machine, so to say, he was really quick with it. Um, you just put it in the book. I don't have it put on. And then you and take a photo and turn the page. And this is not an ideal book here. But he was really quick with it. And um, it's a good device. Um, of course, you would not use it for rare books. As you can see, it has got, it has got glass blades, which is an absolute no-go because of the pigments. They could be, and also tears could be hap could happen. So you wouldn't digitize anything old with it. But for new books, it's perfectly fine, and it's a quick way of digitizing. And the good thing here is also you have these two cameras, so it's also adaptable. The technology is adaptable, so to say, because we can just change the cameras over the years. So we have. It. We have had it for ages, and it's still good to go, so to say. Um, then we have um, the little brother of our camera table. It's called the Traveler, because um, the clue here is that you can fold it and put it in a, in a um, suitcase, and you can even take it on a plane. It has hand luggage size. You can just put it together, put it in a, a suitcase and um, take it on a plane, as I said. And this is something that has been done and this is something why this is, has been developed because there have been projects going on in um, Syria and in um, Armenia. And Erich and uh, Manfred, the developer of the tables, they have been to Armenia digitizing in Mataratarán and they have taken this little table with them. So that's pretty handy, so to say. Again, you can put on any camera you want. Uh, it's the same sort of principle as with the big table. Working is a little bit different, but of course it's very good if you can transport it and it's really easy to set it up when you're used to it. It's like five minutes, you are all set and ready to go for digitizing. And it's a mobile digitization device. Um, and this has been even more successful than its big brother. I think um, now 140 uh, of these have been sold. The last one to, what was it? St. Andrews, I think was the last one, yeah. Um, but um, all around the world, basically. And it's also not so expensive. It's, I think, around 10,000 euros, which is not, um, not much for a device like this, if you compare it to other devices. Um, and so this has been very successful and it's still sold. Our conservator is now in retirement, but he's still building those. <laughs> yep. 
yeah, the traveler. Uh, and then we have our last machine. It's always so the one cool. that is most fun to show off. <laughs> um, it's called Etreventus, and it's a digitization robot. It's a bit tricky to call it a robot. I will talk about this later. But it's also been, it has been developed by a small company in Vienna. And the thing is that it works with air, three ventus, three winds, so to say. So air comes from diff three different sides and the pages are turned with air. So that's how it works. So there's no operator turning the pages as we've seen with the other devices. You always need a person turning the pages. Here it's done by the robot. And I'll just show you how it works. Let's see if it does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> yeah. See, the pages are sucked up and within the head there's the scanner and it scans the pages while sucking them up. And once you are set up, you can do and start an automatic job. Let's see. And it goes on and on and on like this. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's <laughs> <is> pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is like more of sort of the Google principle, so mass digitization as it as it lives, so to say. Um, this one is supposed, to, you can see it here, it says 1,230 uh, pages an hour. So you can just put it on and it um, works on its own, so to say. That was the idea behind it, but I have to say it's a bit tricky <laughs> at times. It can be tricky because you also need to move the book a little bit and then it, again, has its, has its problems. But it's also already a bit dated, um, so that's also maybe why it's not working. But usually it's, 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 it's a good thing and we still have it in use, but this one it was around 100,000. So you can imagine this one is pretty cheap, the travel line comparison, if you think about it. Um, yeah, so we moved from careful digitization of rare manuscripts and books to modern mass digitization. And we try to cover every, everything, so to say and um, have um, depending on the needs. Um, and that's also, we all the staff here is, is trained, um, especially in the different machinery, but also has an academic background in order to cater for the various needs. Um, my colleague here, for example, he had a lot of um, interaction going on with the professors and working for uh, lecturers and stuff like that. So you need to know how to communicate with the people and what to cater for their needs, but also you need to know, uh, to need to be able to assess the material. So uh, we need to see a book and estimate, okay, what can we do with it? Can we digitize it? What, do I, what device are we going to use? How are we going about this? Can we do it at all? So that's the things that you need to consider when digitizing. Okay, yeah? How do you depend on a book? Which mission you use? Um, that's the, uh, in the estimation of the operator, as I said. So we are, as I said, this is not my area of expertise, but my colleague, he, he's trained on the different machines, and he then estimates what's best to use for which book, depending very much on the material. So it's in an in the individual um, decision. But as I said, here we do nothing earlier than 1920, something like that. So modern books. Uh, so they need needn't be handled with so much care, but still it's um, the different machines have different aspects to them and you need to decide what is best to use for every material. Okay, thank you.
Thanks.